I'm going to talk about small cities today, and um, it's my pleasure to be here with uh, such a wonderful and very smart and intelligent uh, panel. I'm going to start introducing very briefly, because uh, they are the uh, main characters of this uh, show. Uh, on my left, Soledad Muñoz, the Minister of Housing of Paraguay, the youngest person ever appointed to a cabinet minister in Paraguay. Congratulations and thank you for being here. Jonathan Harsh is the founder and executive producer of Utopia. And uh, Bebop Grestek, co-founder and chairman of Hyperloop Transportation Technology. Gracias. And Daniel Annenberg, Secretary of Innovation and Technology, the city of Sao Paulo. You have a great city and I'm sure plenty of experience to share with us today when we talk about smart cities. And uh, last but not least, Cristiano Amon, Executive Vice President and President of Qualcomm. Thank you for being here all. Uh, I would like to start with a very uh, simple question to um, just uh, frame our topic. Where the cities of Latin America, where our cities are, are heading to? And I would like to start with the minister, uh, please. The floor is yours. Okay, good morning to everybody. Well, thank you very much, Gusto. It is a pleasure for me to be here and be part of, the, of this panel. I'm going to switch to Spanish, so um, I'm going to talk in my native language. And okay, la pregunta es bastante como, como amplia, interesante. Yo creo que cuando hablamos de las ciudades, lo importante es entender de que cada ciudad es diferente. Bueno, a veces no, no existe una receta, una receta única. De hecho, yo vengo de Asunción, una ciudad pequeña, capital de la República del Paraguay, una ciudad de un poco más de 500.000 habitantes. Y estamos aquí en San Paulo, que es una escala completamente diferente y distinta de ciudad y que requiere abordajes distintos. Y creo que ahí la clave cuando pensamos en desarrollo sostenible, en Smart Cities, es el manejo de la data, Data Management. ¿Cómo podemos medir la realidad de nuestras ciudades para poder abordar y diseñar las políticas públicas que se requieren para, para garantizar el desarrollo sostenible de nuestras ciudades? ¿no? Talking about data, uh, Cristiano, how, how uh, your company, private sector in general, but your company particularly, can help cities with data, analyzing this data and collecting this data? You know, uh, it's, it's, it's part of what we believe is the strategy for the future. Everything will be connected. Actually, one of the main missions of our company now uh, is as we drive from where we are in 4G to 5G, uh, 5G generation wireless is to get everything connect connected. And that once everything gets connected and intelligent, uh, you start to have a lot of data. And then with data, you can increase efficiency. I think the first answer to your question is uh, we are driving very aggressively uh, the Internet of Things and assuming that many of existing uh, systems today will become smarter and connected to the cloud using cellular connectivity, using Wi-Fi connectivity, and, and having efficiency in processing. I think that become, becomes the foundation of the infrastructure so the data can be collected and analyzed. It. I also believe that when you think about the smart cities, one one of the, of the projects, there are a number of projects that our company has been involved, and it's 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 uh, it's it's very interesting. Most of the cities can actually have the upgrade of the infrastructure to a smart infrastructure self-funded, because as you as you bring some new systems, they have a significant reduction on the operating expenses, and that in itself funds the technology. So I think the big obstacle is to get started. But you know the the opportunities are immense as you get things more intelligent and more capable. There is a positive virtual cycle that can be generated with cities. Mm -hmm. So Paulo is is collecting data. What type of data are you uh, most interested in, and why? Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I will talk in Portuguese. Nós estamos trabalhando e não é simples porque é simple because we receive a city that was not connected at all so we we have to set the basis the foundations for it and I understand it's the foundations connectivity infrastructure and also data open data the more data the more open data we have the better and we were working on different fronts we have the traffic lights that are intelligent or smart traffic lights uh, smart 
lightning. But not only that, but we have to work, in, work on education, we have to work on health care. For instance, for health care, we have to integrate information of the medical history, the electronic medical history. Today in Sao Paulo, a lot of things are in paper, and they don't talk to one another. So. We have uh, the, the, the city level, the state level, the federal level, and we don't have a dialogue there. And in the education, today we have a spaces that are the education centers that are unified. Uh, but a lot of things is in paper, on blackboard, on boards. It's not technological. So for, for these centers, now we have, we're working on robotics, on innovation, on technology. And for our, for our office, now we have the, the fab labs, which is the, the things of of do yourself, and we are more and more encouraging these labs, like 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 Mob Lab for for urban mobility. So we open data about uh, buses and uh, parking spots, and also the startups. So we have the startups that can provide applications to provide uh, good solutions for the, for the city. So we have, we're have we working on different fronts, and our, our office work across them so that we have, we have to reduce red tape, we have to simplify things, and have electronic services. Um, transportation and data. Um, how is this marriage? It's very important for us. In our case, we were lucky enough to actually start a new transportation system. We are not a boat, we are not a train, we are not a car, and we're not an airplane. We are a, a fifth mode of transportation, so we could restart by pressing the reset button and trying to capitalize from the past experience. We discovered a lot of dysfunction. For example, 70% of the operation that we do at the airport, you can actually do it even before you arrive there. And security can be actually based heavily on data analysis and only cluster people based on risk profiles. Data allow you also to optimize all the value chain of the travel from the moment the person push the button and some we call it agent will pick him up and pick him her up and bring it to the local hyperloop station we will be embarking in a journey that will be redefined completely the passenger experience for us it wasn't and nonsense to actually um, recreate what we have now, first class, second class. We think that the passenger experience should be based on experience. We are different people when we travel uh, with our wife, with our boss, with our like tourists, or even when we go or come back to work, we have different needs. The Hyperloop is redesigning completely this based on data. And there's also another opportunity, the possibility to actually have a complete frictionless experience by designing smart contracts that actually allow to switch intermodal between the systems without even touching your wallet. And that's for us the passenger experience of the future. Maybe not the wallet of the passenger, but yes, maybe the budget of a company. I mean, this morning I read um, an article regarding to a problem that United Airlines had with uh, some docs that yeah. were uh, sent to different locations. And yeah. it's a big deal in the US uh, right now. <laughs> it seems that there are another, not other news to talk about. But anyway, um, and, and, and the company at some point, uh, one analyst said, uh, it doesn't matter because at the end, the individual is gonna choose by price, not by experience. I, I disagree. I think the passenger experience, if you, if you can have a tailor-made service, you're also willing to pay for it. And of course, this can actually lead to models that doesn't require a ticket. We want, for example, to have an hyperloop that can actually, by the excess of energy that we can produce with the solar panel that we put on, on top and the combination of renewable energy, 
that we have embedded in the system, we can actually almost subsidize the entire um, uh, um, capex, uh, opex. So we can actually recoup the, uh, the uh, cost of transporting this passenger. Now, you can also you can use the ticket or a dynamic ticketing system to actually um, give services to people and not necessarily use the ticket as a monetization system. So we are redesigning, for example, the entire capsule based on the profile. For example, kids need different things than uh, uh, people that are working, right? And the capability of being of having a small capsule that can depart every 30 seconds allow you to actually personalize the passenger experience. So in the future, I foresee more and more the, the traffic, uh, the um, transportation as a let's say a commodity that will embed services, and this will be the business model. Daniel also talked about slums, and I know that. Um, uh, Jonathan, uh, you you are very focused on slums in in, in on how how to transform those areas of the cities that are in reality that sometimes are not in the news, but or for good reasons in the news, but it's they, they are part of the uh, Latin American society. What uh, this um, data and analysis and planification can can do to help that that um, area of the cities and particularly the people who live there. You know, I think data, we need a coherent story on slums. We have that globally on HIV AIDS. Uh, we have that on clean water. We kind of know where we've come from. We know where we're at. We know kind of the direction that we should be heading. And as soon as that became more coherent, we had an acceleration of progress in all of these areas. And we don't see that same thing in slums. And so there needs to be this, we need data that show us patterns and a simple story in this emerging complexity. When we look out, project out to the end of the century, the mega cities uh, of the world are no longer uh, Tokyo or New York. They're uh, Lagos with 88 million people. Uh, they're uh, Mumbai with 67 million people. They're Kabul of all places with 54 million people, which show the truth of why mega cities are becoming mega cities. They're growing from people flooding from the countryside uh, to the nearest economic opportunity. And I think that your know, technology has, technology and data certainly has a, a role to play, a critical role to play uh, in these cities. But I think we need a, a fundamentally different model of cities for the emergence of what's happening across Asia and Africa in particular and somewhat Latin America. And so we're trying to create these micro cities uh, right now with the city of Ulaanbaatar uh, to create a city within a city, if you will. So for up to 100,000 members, it uh, becomes a special demonstration zone for the city. So it begins to test things in uh, somewhat safe ways uh, that, if proven correct, then the city can then more easily roll those technologies out and those solutions out across uh, the, the more formal city as well. So we actually think that the rethinking of slums, these informal slums, which has always been seen as our greatest deficit in the last century, that informality actually uh, provides a white space. It is an adaptive uh, city within a city that could, the rethinking of slums could well bring about a future of urban living that we all hope for, right? We talk about uh, cities that, sh our cities should be more uh, sustainable. They should be more walkable. They should be more human scale. Uh, and yet the formal cities that we have today are quite calcified. They're hard to change and hard to adapt. And slums are very easy to adapt. And so I think actually the, that could pave the way for a future of urban living that we're all longing for. But, but when, when we talk about slums, uh, m most of the governments don't even know how many people live there. Mm. What type of um, uh, data yeah. are the most important, the basic one, to start doing something? Yeah. Well, obviously population. And I think satellite imagery uh, these days um, can help with that. We also, I think emergence theory, I'm not sure if, how many of us are familiar with emergence theory, but this idea that simple things connected in different ways can arise complexity. And I think that explains both the trajectory of the growth of slums, how they might grow, how large they might grow, and the direction that they might grow in. And also, I think it, it gives us some ideas of why cities uh, and slums are, why they emerge the way they do it and, and don't collapse in on, on themselves amidst all that complexity, right? And I think we as, as human beings have, we're feeling the, the pain, we're reaching our limits uh, of how much we can deal and understand with the complexity that's arising. And so we need more elegant lenses like emergence theory to be able to understand both the emergence as well as attractors that we can design within that to influence the flow and direction of cities in the future. Cristiano, you want to say something about uh, the, the data, the collection data from slums? Christian. 
No, Jenna, I just wanted to, uh, you know, when we look at the, at the area, you know, of expertise, we're kind of more focused on foundation technology, but I have, like, there's a particular, uh, you know, a project that I'm very passionate about it because, you know, it's easy to, it's easy to understand, you know, how exactly economically viable and it can be applicable to all locations, including, you know, less privileged areas. So I just want to maybe use this opportunity to talk about that. One, when you look at the infrastructure that exists in cities and, 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 and when you go from where they are right now and what they could become if you make it smart, I just want to walk to a simple example. Um, in many of those, in those places, uh, you know, develop or in developed area, you have city lights, something as basic as you have a street pole and I have, and I have a light in there. Most of those uh, that have been deployed, they have uh, incandescent or fluorescent lights. And a simple thing, it's a very simple, a simple project that you can replace them with LED and you save energy. So if you actually replace them with LED, they are savings of OPEX. But the whole process of going to replace the LED creates enormous opportunity for smart cities. And I just want to walk you to, the, to that example. And I think those are the things that exactly the economic equation is very easy to be implemented everywhere. As you go to a, to a, to a city pool and you're going to upgrade an LED, then you can put a smart light. Smart light will, you know, will have sensors, will detect, you know, presence, and it will, it will basically modulate. Then you can put a camera in there. And uh, you put a smart connected camera once you went, you know, to the pole uh, to, to provide the upgrade. And that's a smart camera, which means we'll only transmit data if it's relevant. All of a sudden you have 24 by 7 surveillance and inc increased security. What about privacy? Huh? What about privacy? Well, it's, it, you, have, you have the ability, you have the ability to have privacy laws like you have today. You know, that will probably regulate that information and be used for the only purpose of law enforcement and security. In the population, knowing that surveillance exists, I think we have seen in many cases, it is like having cameras in your house, uh, outside your house, it is an inhibitor of crime and people actually feel more safe. Actually, people walking in the street at night, knowing that there'll be surveillance, they want the camera to be there. But, but let me just continue because I don't want to stop on the camera. You have a camera that it is, you can be smart about data, but then you can actually, once you go to that pole, you can put a wireless infrastructure where there's a public Wi-Fi access point or you know a, a, a small cell of high-speed cellular. Once you put that infrastructure there, then you can connect all of the meters around those houses, whether it's gas meter, whether it's electrical meter, whether it's a water meter, and then you can actually uh, use that as an infrastructure to other devices with data, you know, collect data. So it starts from a very simple thing, and in some cases, just the energy savings alone uh, creates a significant upgrade on infrastructure, and then you, all of a sudden you have the foundation in place that you can connect other things with it and uh, provide data. And, uh, and those, they're, they look complex, but they're simple uh, to do, and then you start to have the virtual cycle of having everything in a connected city, and you, you know, and the, from there you go to other services and Are, are they expensive? Um, some of some of those projects that we've seen, just the energy savings alone. Uh, you know, if you if you look at how many municipalities work today, cities don't have capex. Cities in general don't have capex, but they have opex. So if you look at how much money they have to pay for some of those those services, once you apply. Uh, in the case of that example I provided, the technology, it provides savings across the board, not only on energy, but all things run efficiency, and that pays for the capex. So actually those are, in many cases, the, same, the cases that we've seen all self-funded projects. So that, Daniel, could you share with us uh, examples of uh, what uh, Cristiano mentioned, that you uh, buy or develop a technology that it had a cost, but also the return was very useful for the city, saving money and providing new services uh, or increasing protection uh, in your public policies. Soledad? A ver, primero, 
poder compartir desde la perspectiva de gobierno, yo creo que coincidimos en la necesidad de tener... We agree on the need to be, uh, for there to be an intelligent, a smart city, and we need to have the data in order to implement the adequate um, policies for the uh, cities. Paraguay is the less urbanized country of South America. There is a window of opportunity to see what has worked and what has not worked in the region, and Paraguay has had for several years a policy of uh, hu urban development on, based on uh, how housing. And uh, in Paraguay, we are developing a first national policy of uh, housing, and we included all these policies of uh, technological innovation. But I think the challenge we have um, beyond further uh, thinking in smart cities is how we can have an inclusive city above all in Amer Latin America when, 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 where one in every four uh, inhabitants live in a slum. They live, uh, and so how will we make the balance of a budget that one has every year? How much to invest in the economic develop technological development when you have an urgent need like, like providing a safe place for people where to live in Paraguay? We have a, f a large amount of the population living in extremely uh, 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 poor situation, and now we are reallocating several uh, families which live in uh, conditions of formality without access to basic uh, services. So this is interesting for the debate. So I like to, we'd like to know how much this costs. We need to see the cost-benefit relation, how much a government should invest. And then we should uh, see how we can improve the articulation, which was mentioned before, uh, among the different levels of government in order to be able to guarantee um, efficient policy. And the resources are scarce. Before passing the floor to Daniel, a concrete example that you could uh, put it over there as an example that investing in technology even though it has a cost has a benefit for us the transparency was key when we started uh, our work in an institution that was weakened we developed a platform of open data and all the information on the budget was public with interaction with all the citizens that allows to improve the auditing in our uh, uh, work and with the local government. This was a very low cost uh, investment and had a tremendous retribution, a positive one for the administration of the institution that allows to improve the results that we were delivering at each community in the national territory. We have a lot of examples. And in a city, we usually talk about digital, not smart. For example, we have electronic information systems. In the city hall in Sao Paulo, as Mayor Doria said, we are already investing in that. So everything that we did in paper is going to be done electronically. Nowadays, 75% of every procedure is done electronically in our city hall. So we have 340,000 procedures per year that is going to save us a lot of time in those procedures. And that is the first step for a digital city, not a smart city. The same thing applies to opening a company or a legal entity in Brazil. It used to take 100 days to start your company in Brazil. And now everything is electronic and it is independent. So we changed the dynamics. Now we believe entrepreneurs instead of just asking them for a ton of documents. So nowadays we are able to open a company in less than five days. This is to show you that now we are decreasing bureaucracy to have a smarter city. And as I told you, we have city lights, we have traffic lights and all of those items. However, I'm always worried about taking those services to people who need it the most. A smart city is only going to make sense if people that need it the most feel that that technology is getting to them, if they have access to it. For example, when I was leading the traffic department, for us it was really important to get the population involved and to anticipate their needs. We were proactive, we were paying attention to their needs. In the city and state of Sao Paulo, 30 days before a driver's license 
expires, we send people a message. We say, hey, your driver's license is going to expire in 30 days, so please you need to renew it. That is what it means to be proactive, and governments should be so. Now, smart cities for us have everything to do with data transparency. And we think that startups in our civil society should be a part of this process. Now, as we are more open, as we share data, things change. Our bus transportation system is an example. We have over 17,000 buses traveling around Sao Paulo every day. And everybody has access to that information now. We have an app, for example, and with this app, when people get to the bus stop, they know how many minutes this bus is going to take to reach them. That is fantastic. That is a revolution for us because people can make smart decisions. They can decide whether they are going to go back home, if they're going to take the subway or call an Uber or take another bus or walk to work. So as we share data with people and as we welcome private initiatives, we find new innovative solutions for our city. That is how we get to a smart city, in my opinion. Here, but I, I would like to um, go deep uh, on one aspect that Daniel mentioned now, which is the private sector, the public sector, and the environment that create the public sector in order to the private sector uh, growth and also uh, be uh, engaged with the public sector. What are you asking? The most important thing that you are asking the public sector in order to develop your projects and also helping the public sector and the uh, public in general? So, Hyperloop represents a, a big innovation in transportation because the entire sector on the ground and from last year, maybe now we're starting to see some profits, but even uh, the, the air industry was the same, everything was subsidized. The business model of transportation around the world was based on taxpayers. None of the system that we developed are making money. So the first aspect that we looked into is how to create a system that actually doesn't depend on subsidies because we can't continue to solve one problem and create another 10. And the answer was about the efficiency. Everyone knows the hyperloop about the speed, but that's not the most interesting part. We worked on the two aspects, how we generate electricity and how we can create a system that actually consume very tiny fraction of the energy of the actual systems. Now, the result is a system that actually can recoup the investment in eight to 10 years, depending on where you're building. In some countries like India, we have feasibility studies that shows even five years of return on investment. And this is very significant and important because we start to get the rid of the consumption model that we embedded in our transportation systems. We need to start to redefine, yes, what we were saying, human-centric uh, transportation, but also transportation that doesn't consume our resources. And we didn't have to look very far to understand that we have solar, we have geothermal, we have wind, we have a lot of uh, access. From 2016, the solar energy is equivalent, the cost is equivalent to petrol. So it's a historical year, because now it can only get better. The efficiency is going up, the price is going down. Now we can free the planet from the consumption model. And to the states right now, we're proposing PPPs. They are public-private partnership, where they can put an initial fund that is maximum 30%. We put 70% because now we can actually attract real investors. And when everybody has recouped the investment, we will pay a fee to the government. And these are, this becomes a, a, from a situation where they, these were the, the transportation were the black holes of the GDP into actually system that can foster and uh, um, strive and make a country strive uh, based on their transportation systems. Jonathan. Yeah, with our microcities, uh, we ask three things and three things alone from governments, city governments. One is that they help us allocate the area to be converted uh, into a microcity because we don't want to run into trouble later. Uh, two is that they make sure that they 
provide the main arteries that we can plug into if necessary. We try not to plug into the main arteries because we're looking for more decentralized solutions. Uh, and three, that they allocate it as a special demonstration zone so it becomes semi-autonomous. And that allows us semi uh, uh, autonomy allows us to bring in solutions that we say are more next generation that may not match, uh, m match the needs or the demands of current legislation, but allows us to prove that out. And so when we say next generation uh, solutions, we always say solutions versus technologies because we think a system, our city is made up of many systems, right? It's not only the hardware, but we have education systems and healthcare systems and energy systems and actually even governance sy systems as well. It's a chance to rethink all different aspects of that. But that becomes challenging for us when we say next generation, right? I live in Silicon Valley, and so we're always throwing these buzz buzzwords around. And so we put something, a very simple measure, a goal for us for every solution that we're trying to curate in these different areas that it'd be three times faster and, and to deploy and three times uh, cheaper. And obviously three times cheaper is harder to match than three times faster. But in many of these different solutions that we're looking for, there actually are new possibilities. You know, the last year of, of advance in technologies were like the three years compressed before that. Those three years are like the 10 years compressed before that. And so there is a lot of brand new possibility in front of us. And I think for, uh, for, for corporations to be thinking about what does it look like in a few decades when three and a half billion people live in slums that have some purchasing power, micro-purchasing power, but some purchasing power? Are there different approaches, different models, different services and products uh, that can meet the needs with better quality and lower prices? And I think there is a, an opportunity there. Yes, you know, I wanna just uh, make one comment, uh, just, uh, you know, connecting, I think, comment made by Daniel and also the comment you made about, you know, uh, how to be more inclusive. Uh, we run a pilot project here in Brazil. It proved to be very successful, and I think it could be replicated. So I'll give an example in Brazil, I'll give an example in India. Uh, when you talk about a digital city, not even a smart, but a digital city, and then you start to connect everything and become a smart city, then you want to connect to people. And the reality is, uh, you know, the largest platform ever built by mankind is the smartphone. And I think it's now part of everybody's lives. But and it, when you look at Latin America, and it's a common thing throughout, you know, uh, other uh, geographical areas that you you have, you know, developing economies. A lot of people have smartphones. Not everybody can afford the data. Not everybody has a data plan. So this project actually started as a, you know, a conversation. Actually, I remember when we this this is a pilot project. We're having, you know. Uh, you know, a lunch with uh, some individuals of the Brazilian government, and you know, I was talking about some what I thought was an interesting, you know, inconsistency. Like you had in Brazil, like a one eight hundred number, toll free number zero eight hundred. So you have a zero eight hundred number for a lot of public services, but when you call the number, it tells you to go to the website. And if you don't have a computer or if you don't have a data plan, how do you go to the website? So why not have the concept of, you know, 1-800 for data? So in this program, I think with the uh, support of the Minister of Communication, uh, it was done a pilot project and it created an internet address in Brazil, 0800.br. And I think, you know, we started with Sao Paulo. We actually, we did an application, for example, Qualcomm did as part of the program an application that uh, individuals could schedule medical appointments with the SUS system, and no location of pharmacies, location of things, and then other banks start to see the savings of actually providing uh, bank services when they pay the operator. So it create a situation that a lot of people that were not connected because they could not afford the data, they were connected, and the system allowed the receiving you know, part to pay for the data connection. So I think initiatives like this, that actually as you make the city digital and connected, then you empower people with the tools so they connect to the digital city, I think are gonna be essential. And I think things like this project within Brazil that could be replicated to have, I know it's difficult when you use the word net neutrality in the United States, but maybe the, the, there should be some elements of the internet that you could have specific different type of tariff and reverse uh, charging and that we will enable, you know, everybody to be connected. Soledad and uh, Daniel. Me gustaría, bueno, agregar algo justo respecto al 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 desafío que tenemos de vincular al sector. We have of linking our people uh, with the private and the public, and uh, have a sustainable development. We all agree that this is a trend that is affecting the population, 
in the uh, sustained development is one of the continents that's more organized in the world, but has an important contrast with the uh, situation of reality of poverty in the informal work. And we're not going to win it if we don't work together. Uh, we have representatives of the local governments, and there is a great challenge in how we articulate in the several levels of uh, governance. When we have uh, political differences, it's uh, a tremendous cost to coordinate this work at the different levels of the government and to have a process of uh, trust in the public service should be a frontal battle against corruption that affects the Latin American and Caribbean region. And we will uh, uh, have a, and uh, if we don't know, if we don't agree in this measures, ethical measures to guarantee the sustainable development of the city, we're not going to be able to attain this. Uh, people are expecting better living conditions I would like to highlight this. Thank you. I think Christian will talk about some things that are important. Using new technologies and cell phones, especially smartphones, they are fundamental, crucial for us to reach, especially people who need more. I think Maria and Jonathan also talked about the questions. I think the main challenge of our cities, especially in America, is how can we integrate these people, how can we include these people? And I think we can do it only if they realize that technology is here to help their quality of life. If they can use technology to so that they can be integrated in society, included in society. I'm going to give an example that we have done here in the city of Sao Paulo. Today we have a public Wi-Fi in 120 squares, and especially in the in the outskirts where people use more. The other day, a, a bank in Brazil uh, provided Wi-Fi on Paulista Avenue, but not many people used it because people on Paulista Avenue they already have access to the to the data packages, but in the outskirts people don't have access to data. So I think the challenge is how to bring these people and show them that technology, innovation, and smart cities are thinking about them. Because I think this is the, the big challenge, especially for cities in Latin America. Because if we don't include these people, we're going to to increase the gap between people who have access to technology and those who don't have access to technology. So this is a huge challenge. I don't have the answers to it, but we have to work together with the public sector and the private sector, with all the levels of, of government, and this is a huge challenge. But I think there is another big challenge too, which is to work on culture. So how can we make people understand that this technology is actually interesting for them? Because in Brazil, for many years, people would go to, to, to the to the branches, to the bank branches. We don't have to go to the bank branches because the banking system in Brazil has simplified. It's simpler. You can use an application. You can use your bank line. You can use a, you can use your smartphone. So the banking system, which is one of the largest in the world, and and somehow has innovated a lot. We, for the public sector, we have to innovate a lot too, so that we can reach this, these people who need the most of the public service, and and oftentimes they don't don't find solutions quickly and uh, conveniently for, for health care, transportation, and education. Jonathan. Where's the informal and formal? Because as we've looked at the development of cities across Latin America, Asia, Africa, we've always disconnected that. And I think that's a, to our loss. And you know, slums aren't destroying our cities. I think they're creating something new, actually. And that's a provocative statement, I think, is a true statement. So one question I would have back to us is, my concern is that we still see cities as machines. In reality, they're emerging organisms. And so as we talk about technology uh, and connecting technology down to the lowest levels, to all levels within the city, how do we, how do we embed that technology into this concept, actually, a city is an, emerging, an emergent organism? And I think last century was a fantastic century of linear thinking and linear building. It was a century of the engineer. And I think we really have, have massively benefited. Our quality of life has massively benefited from that. But I think this century is about lateral thinking, about connecting the dots in new and unusual ways. And cities are, as we try to treat cities as machines and try to solve them as machines, we're reaching our limits. We're hoping that AI and data, big data, of course, can bail us out a bit, which it can in many ways. But it also has its limits. There's, there's, there's smartness in that, in that, but not wisdom in that, right? So how do we see the city as an 
organism, not a machine? How do we see the efforts that we're making as wise, not only smart? Um, and when we are creating smart seedings, uh, we are increasing uh, the mobility of people, but also goods. And that brings us to the challenge of environment and how these uh, new cities are sustainable in the future from the environment perspective. How do you challenge, how do you help uh, people uh, in order to preserve or even to gain uh, some space that we have lost already uh, in terms of uh, sustainability and uh, respect of the so environment? The, the answer to this question came when we started to analyze how to build the system. When we look what we do right now in highways, in trains, uh, if you think about it, the, the business model around it is really broken because we go to a farmer and we say, okay, give me your land and uh, I will give you, when you're lucky, some money, <laughs> when you're lucky, and then I give you an exchange of pollution and noise. That's our business model. What do you think the farmer will do? Will fight, right? Because these are his land and he's cultivating and it's a broken model. So when we look at the possibility to actually build on pylons the system is for several reasons. The first reason is that you have a minimal impact on the ground. You can build it in a way that animals can continue to migrate. You don't have, you don't bifurcate the land in two. This is a tremendous impact in the land. And also you can build it with new materials like ultra high performance concrete that can absorb carbon dioxide and release oxygen. You can shape it in a way that endangered species can actually use it as a nest. We can do vertical gardening. We have the technology and the solution for these kind of things. It's just a narrow putting together the best minds that we have in the planet and use best practices. And that's what we are doing. We are actually creating a system that is dynamically built depending on where you're building, the morphology of the terrain, and also respecting the environment. We are lucky because the system itself is a system that is working on a semi-vacuum, so it's completely silent and it's protected in its environment, so it doesn't have any emission. And on top of it, you can actually build and carry several of the resources we need. When you have a, a pipeline and a solar panel, you basically have a desalinization system. So why don't we take water from the sea and bring it in the same infrastructure? When you have a system like that, you can actually bring bandwidth. But, but somebody, somebody could argue you uh, that that's fantastic, sounds very good on the paper, but when we talk about uh, the cost of the infrastructure and the project, it's not worth it because that type of cities have other needs first rather than develop these amazing projects. But that's an oversimplification because when you continue, the, the fool is that repeats the same mistake pretending that there is some different result. But you, right? but you are dealing with politicians well, and I politicians with, with all due respect things in short term, not long term. I agree. Or but not all of them. The problem is that right now we are building solutions that we already know what is the outcome. They will never keep the investment and they condemn the state of a constant state of subsidies. When you have a solution that actually can get rid of the subsidies and also solve the problem of traffic because it can deliver safely, fast, efficiently, people and goods to cities that are distant thousands of kilometers away. And we reshape completely the concept of city because now cities that are 1,000 kilometers distant, they are half an hour, one hour uh, uh, far away. Especially in countries that are now the, let's say, so-called third world war, the third uh, world or uh, underdeveloped, that's the biggest opportunity we have because we can leapfrog into systems that actually are better, more economically viable and sustainable. The right to defend and the two politicians. Are politicians looking only the short term? Soledad and Daniel. Sie siempre hay un contraste. A ver, en Paraguay yo creo de que hemos evolucionado bastante en la calidad de la política pública con, con la implementación de, de proyectos que tienen una visión de largo plazo. Creo que es el gran desafío que tiene el sector público comenzar a planificar mejor. Porque si planificamos podemos articular cuáles son las inversiones que son las más adecuadas. Which will be more adequate for the moment and that in middle uh, term or long term can be... Uh, um, fulfilling and there uh, there's a theme of soil as well of the ground 
those cities have to be well planned because as a finite resource, the housing projects is more is something has to do more with, more with my uh, ministry if the housing projects are not well articulated with the transport policies the cost will be ever higher and sometimes you want uh, an immediate result the polit traditional polit politician uh, ha there's a contrast with a need to plan in terms of having a, a long-term vision and articulate the housing policies with policies of employment generation and public transportation in order to not have an overcost. I think there's something very important here that Maria said. We have short and long-term projects, and politicians, in a way, need to balance those because they need short answers, they need short results because of the elections. Let me give you an example. In the, in the City Hall in Sao Paulo, we have a quick approval project. So with this quick approval project, we approve projects really quickly for our construction. In Sao Paulo, it takes us six months to one year to approve any license or to grant any license. So now we have electronic services, and they have to go through a lot of secretariats. And they go through a lot of secretariats, but in an integrated way. That is great because we can fight corruption because, as Maria said, that is one of the biggest issues that we face. And on the other hand, we are helping people build things in Sao Paulo very, very fast. Everybody is interested in that. And that has to do with a lot of different industries when it comes to politics. Of course, somebody is making money off of the current situation and they are a few people and they are corrupt. But everybody else agrees that we need that kind of streamlining system. So when we get those points of contact or that kind of consensus with electronic services and data opening and integration, everybody is going to be happy about it as long as they are good people with good intentions. And we need to think about policies that are, are sustainable. For example, we kept some policies and projects from the previous government. The Fab Labs had to do with the previous government, the Mob Lab as well. So we are not going to finish or end those products since they're good. And they don't require a specific party. Transparency and reduce corruption, right? Perfect. That, totalmente. Por isso, quanto mais trans... My point. And as we have more transparency, more society engagement or citizen engagement and the engagement of companies, and that is why startups are so important, everything gets more interesting. So we need to show that, yes, if you work at the public sphere, it is possible to find good solutions with private companies and with universities. 20 days ago, we had a seminar to talk about one of the issues we have in Sao Paulo. And we said that just like you have Cornell University in New York, or as you have universities in Barcelona, we want to use a specific space in Sao Paulo where they use to distribute goods, a place called Cia Jaspi. And we need to convince the universities that we should have a university neighborhood, let's put it this way, because we can no longer do it by ourselves. You see, we need help from the private sector. 
And if we are able to establish those partnerships, we are going to have interesting solutions. Have you had a bad experience with corruption when you deal with uh, public sector in your projects? Likely not, because we are a very uh, novel company. Uh, we, we signed 11 deals in countries, and uh, every time I think the, the hype of the hype of right now is so big that uh, we are really proposing a, 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 a concrete solution for the government. I think corruption is fight exactly how um, he explained, by transparency, by actually using new technologies. You know, we have the technology blockchain, for example, that can actually track and monitor and can actually allow us to solve a lot of this problem, including the problem of privacy. And I think we need to look into best practice around the world because they're already an uh, amazing example of success in this. This can actually be the path to combat, to combat and uh, get rid of corruption. Christian. Um, you know, we, we actually don't have in, <laughs> in, um, in on our line of business, in many cases, we're just a technology enabler. We're like we're chipset and system companies. We have many people in the chain, so we don't have direct engagement. But, uh, but one comment that I would say, and I think I echo, I think what my colleague here said, uh, the best, the best solution to that problem is really, you know, having the government thinking about what is the solution that he can do in partnership with the private sector, and then let the private sector, you know, implement it and continue. And so you, then you don't, it doesn't become, you know, a a, a project that is subject to short-term thinking of the government, but it's actually a project that continues. And I think the more that you digitize everything, the more that you empower the people to be every one of the city's uh, members, an agent, they have access to the same information, you promote transparency and you just go into the right direction. Jonathan, any comments? If not, we're going to the Q&A. No, I, I fully agree. And I think that uh, on the microcity, we're um, embarking on uh, approach using blockchain and AI uh, to lay out the governance and administration system. And I think that does wonders to transparency and uh, less corruption. Let's head to the audience. Yep. Questions? There is a mic over here. Anyone? No questions? So everything was clear from the perspective? Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Hi, Salvador Perez from Visa in Latin America. A question more on the transportation side. How you see open loop payment systems evolving in, in transportation and the contribution that this can create from a financial inclusion perspective, but in general to make smarter cities? Who do you address the question? Well, primarily to Mr. Gresta, but whoever, or probably Jonathan can add some perspective as well. Okay, so, but, uh, Inside the World Economic Forum, there's an advanced mobility group that is actually working on um, solutions to this. We are analyzing with uh, top companies around the world uh, how to actually imagine a future that is fully integrated and actually uh, <laughs> devoted to uh, solve a lot of the frictions that we have in the system. I, there's different currents uh, and, and opinions, of course, but I foresee that's our mine and the uh, company that I represent. Um, we foresee a future that is completely digital, frictionless, and integrated. We are embracing blockchain. We think that this is an incredible opportunity for humanity to actually have a system that has the characteristic to actually answer to all the problem that we have right now, transparency, uh, ownership of that data, um, reliability, um, and a lot of the characteristics that actually humanity will need to develop in the future. The beauty of this is that you are capable of managing network that nobody owns, where you can access and have different companies access and actually pull out the data when it's needed, and then by magic, this data disappears when it's not needed anymore. So you can actually have a full transparent system that can actually monitor and track all the transaction, not only in an economical sense, because my dream is to embed into these new contracts several things that we are not considering humans. For example, carbon footprint. 
if we really price this into the actual transportation system, we will not use the car anymore, right? And so um, the, the, uh, all the aspect, the pollution, so we can actually monitor and track this. Someone should pay for it. Also, the dismantling of our system is not how much the price cost, the, 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 the good cost when we build it. How much does it cost actually to get rid of it? So if we embed all these values inside our value chain, we start to look at a different planet. And my dream is to actually get as fast as we can into this new generation. Okay. We only have one, uh, two minutes, uh, and I have two, wor two words requested. So Jonathan and Daniel, and I think with that, we will close the panel. So very quickly, I think this uh, blockchain is really fascinating because it is a, a dull, simple piece of technology, right? It's a basic uh, database ledger, right? Um, I think what's really interesting about blockchain is that it resonated so deeply with humanity, and I think when it resonates with a wide swath of humanity, we should pay attention to that. Why does it resonate? Is it, where does it touch on our human nature, and what possibilities does it uh, unleash? And I think that's quite fascinating. When it comes to transportation payment systems, um, when we look at the microcity and we're designing it for 100,000 members, we get to design it however we want to at this stage until we hit reality of, of execution and production. Is we're designing it as a, um, we're, we're banning uh, car ownership uh, within the micro city at this stage. Um, and we recognize that we're in a state of transition that is a city within a city as well. And so we are designing a parking lot on the edge of it. But if you can imagine where uh, it is a, uh, essentially transportation at mobility as a service, uh, we're also pushing that direction. How much, you know, we have we work, we have we live, why not we cities in some ways, right? The idea of monthly subscription services, I think, can reduce tremendous amounts of frictions that we face in our life. And so you simply, you, with your, your app, you call your, uh, your two-seater or your six-seater. Uh, we're also um, minimizing the, the footprint uh, of the vehicles. Uh, and while a lot of times people push back on that and say it's unreasonable, and you push back on that, so we'll cut it off. I'm sorry, but we have just a half minute for Daniel. Please. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jonathan. So, yeah. so, para complement. Let me just add something. I completely agree with you. I would just add something. We need to focus on people. Yes, we have the transportation system, but we have to focus on people. We have the healthcare system, but we need to focus on people. Otherwise, if we don't focus specifically on people, technologies are going to be used by the government and by the private sector, but we need to focus on people, their needs and their requirements. Technology should be a mean to improve quality of life for those who need it the most. So let's focus on people, please. Daniel, Bibop, Jonathan, and Soledad, thank you. And thank you all for your attention. <laughs>